Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's Facebook Live with GBMC Healthcare. Now today we're talking about colon and rectal cancers and what you need to know. So let's welcome our guest, Dr. Nina Ferraris, board certified colon and rectal surgeon at GBMC Hospital. And remember, we want to hear from anyone watching. Please don't hesitate to ask us your questions. Now, welcome Dr. Ferraris. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So talk to us, what is the difference between colon and rectal cancer? Um, so mostly location. Um, the rectum is the last part of the colon right before it empties. Um, and so the where the tumor is uh, determines whether we consider it rectal cancer or colon cancer. Um, the two are treated a little bit differently. We do um, tend to do uh, chemotherapy and or radiation up front for some of our rectal cancer patients. Um, whereas for colon cancer, usually we go straight to surgery um, and then consider chemotherapy afterwards if indicated. Uh, so that can be a little bit different, um, but otherwise they're not terribly different. Okay. And we hear all about them, but when should we start screening for colon and rectal cancers? So in 2018, um, the American Cancer Society actually decreased their recommendation age to 45 for all everybody um, at what we would consider average risk. Um, that number may still be slightly different if you have a family history of colon cancer. And of course, if you're having any concerning symptoms, we recommend you come in and get that checked out sooner. Okay, now we do have a question coming in. Jay asks, if I have bright red rectal bleeding, should I just assume that that is caused by hemorrhoids? Uh, no, absolutely not. Don't assume. Um, if you're having bright red bleeding and it's persisting, um, that is something that you should discuss with your primary care provider and or come in and see a specialist about. Um, better to get it checked out and find out that it is hemorrhoids and maybe nothing to worry about mm -hmm. than to just presume. Okay, and so it seems like a lot of people suffer from hemorrhoids. If, if you have hemorrhoids, does that make you more likely to develop a colon cancer? It doesn't. Hemorrhoids are actually sort of part of the normal anatomy, um, okay. and they can get irritated for a variety of reasons. Um, but having hemorrhoids doesn't predispose you to colon or rectal cancer in any way. Um, the reason that the two get talked about at the same time is because the symptom uh, is sort of the same presenting, it's often bright red bleeding per rectum. And that's something that, again, really you should have it evaluated to differentiate between the two. So that's what I was gonna say. I'd imagine that that is very shocking if that is what you're seeing. And let's say that somebody at home does see that, then who do they go to? Their regular primary care physician, a specialist, or should they just go to the emergency room? How do you know? Everybody's um, insurance and health care is structured a little bit differently. It's always okay to start with your primary care. They should be able to direct you. Um, I would say if you're having persistent bleeding, that that really is something you should see a specialist about. And often the primary will direct you in that direction if it's appropriate. Um, the emergency department is something that we would recommend if you're having other things in addition to the bleeding. If it's really large amounts if you're starting to get dizzy or lightheaded or having any other symptoms like pain that's very severe um, those things would bring you into an emergency room um, most patients know if it's a emergent enough that they need to go to the emergency room um, otherwise you can check in with your primary care provider yeah. so aside from the bleeding what are some other symptoms of colon cancer um, so changing bowel habits can sometimes be an indicator, particularly narrowing of your stool or changing caliber, um, abdominal pain, sudden unexpected weight loss that you really weren't trying for. I think most of us want that to happen, <laughs> but it's not a good thing. Um, abdominal pain is less common, um, but can be a sign. Um, really anything that's concerning or a change should at least be discussed with a healthcare provider. Okay, and why are young people developing colon and rectal cancer? You know, that's an interesting question. We do seem to be seeing it more often, and the short answer is we're not entirely sure. Um, it may be because people are presenting for screening a little bit more willingly than perhaps they have in the past. Um, and yet, 
the numbers seem to indicate that that doesn't fully account for the increased number of cases that we do seem to be seeing. Um, there are some environmental factors that contribute. Uh, family history also contributes. And I think it's probably a combination of all of those things that are um, driving the trend. Okay, and then we talked about screenings and everything else. Uh, how often should somebody over 50 have a colonoscopy? And then same question for somebody who's under 50. Well, so screening should start at 45 now. Right. Um, and the recommendation as to how often is going to come from the provider who does your initial colonoscopy because it depends on what they find okay. um, and what your symptoms are. If you're having ongoing symptoms, you maybe should be screened a little bit more frequently. Um, patients who have polyps on their initial colonoscopy will be screened a little bit more frequently, typically every three to five years, as opposed to the seven to 10 if you don't have any findings on your initial colonoscopy. Patients with a family history may be recommended to get screenings more often. Um, so really you should take the recommendation of the provider who does the initial screening and that will determine the frequency thereafter. Okay, so you mentioned polyps. So talk to us about polyps. What are they? And then if you have them during a colonoscopy and you have them removed, does that mean that you are then more prone to developing colon cancer? Not necessarily. So polyps are an overgrowth of the lining of the colon. Um, in that process of overgrowth, there are mutations that can happen at the cellular level um, that are will eventually um, add up to become colon cancer. We know that patients with polyps that are not treated are at higher risk of developing a colon cancer over the next seven to 10 years. It's a relatively slow process. That's why we remove the polyps when we find them uh, to prevent that process from continuing along that path. Um, so removing a polyp takes away something that could potentially have become a cancer which is great, that decreases your risk of having cancer in the future. Um, but if you are prone to developing polyps, then you will need to be screened more frequently to make sure that you're not developing additional polyps that also need to be removed. Okay, and so let's talk about the prep for colonoscopies. I've had one before, right? So explain to everybody who is watching the different options um, that you have when doing the prep and if there's a benefit to choosing one over another. So your provider will help you choose your prep. I don't think anybody will ever come up with a prep that patients think is delicious. <laughs> I'm not sure that's possible. Um, it's meant to clean out your colon, which is not, not always uh, a lovely process, but it's typically not so bad. They have made advances. Um, there are a number of products out there that do taste significantly better than they used to, are lower volume than they used to be. Um, the preps that we choose now tend to be a split dosing method, which gives us a better clean out and gives you a better screening colonoscopy because we can see better. Um, so less likely that we'll miss something that's small or concerning. Um, and so the split method has you take one small bottle of fluid the night before, followed by the clear liquid of your choice, um, and then a second bottle of the prep in the morning, uh, several hours before the colonoscopy, again, followed by the clear liquid of your choice. And that usually is enough to sort of rinse things out. Okay, so we always hear about family history. Do genetics play a part in your risk of developing a colon rectal cancer? They absolutely can. Family history is an important indicator um, of risk for developing colon cancer. Um, so it is definitely something we take into consideration. There are some ethnicities um, that will predispose. Uh, we know that African Americans have colon cancers at a slightly higher rate. Ashkenazi Jewish uh, folks also have that uh, predisposition. Um, there are genetic conditions um, that, again, will usually be seen in somebody with a family history that can predispose you towards colon cancer. Um, and those are all things that can be screened for, again, basically through the family history and through, through a careful history.
Okay, and so recently in the news, uh, Baltimore Orioles star outfielder Trey Mancini has been diagnosed with colon cancer, of course, so we're all talking about it. So a lot of people were concerned about him as far as talking about treatment and recovery. Is it probable for somebody of his age and cancer stage? And does that matter? Um, it does. The cancer stage uh, matters probably most in the prognosis. Um, Colon cancer is something that typically if we catch early enough, patients do very well with appropriate treatment and follow-up screening. Um, so Trey Mancini, I heard, was a stage three, um, which means that, you know, with appropriate treatment and therapy, he's had his surgery and I believe he's started chemotherapy, which would be appropriate um, for that staging. He should have very good survival um, and recovery after that with with appropriate follow-up. Um, I believe uh, typically for a stage three, we would say we measure things in five-year survival. It's usually around 75% for somebody at that stage. So Okay. And so uh, can you talk about the stages? I know we always hear about it, but especially when it comes to a colon or rectal cancer, can you kind of go through the stages and what that means? Sure. So a uh, stage one um, colon or rectal cancer is a relatively small tumor. So that means that the T size is low. Um, lymph nodes and whether or not the colon cancer has spread beyond the colon are the two other things that we look for in staging. A stage mm -hmm. two cancer is a slightly larger tumor. Stage three typically means that you have some lymph node involvement. Um, and stage four is what's known as metastatic or meaning that it's spread outside of the colon. Okay. And so when we talk about our lymph nodes and then some of the symptoms that you were talking about. I know we, we all know for breast cancer that they talk about lymph nodes, but is there a certain lymph node area that would kind of give you an indication that you have a problem with your colon or rectal cancer? Not one that you can feel. Okay. <laughs> um, so most of the lymph nodes uh, that drain the area around the colon are inside of your abdomen. So it's not really something that you could monitor um, very closely. Every so often, particularly with a rectal cancer, which is lower, you'll get involvement of the lymph nodes in the groin area, but that's okay. pretty unusual. Okay, so again, we just want to invite, invite anyone who has any questions to please type them. We have expert advice here right now. So can we just go through uh, one more time? I know we talked about it in the beginning, but anybody who may be joining late, um, some of the symptoms that people should look out for. Uh, for colon or rectal cancer and how they can differentiate that from hemorrhoids or anything else. Yeah, absolutely. So bright red blood or any bleeding um, per rectum or a change in the color of your stool, darkening of the stool, those are all things that should be evaluated. Change in bowel habits from your normal routine. If all okay. of a sudden you notice that you're having smaller bowel movements or becoming more constipated or having diarrhea, those are things that should be reviewed with a healthcare provider and checked out. Um, abdominal pain, unexpected weight loss. I know, again, we, we all wish we had that, but it is not something that you should take lightly. It should be evaluated. Um, those are all things that should really be checked out. Okay. And so we just had a question uh, come in from a viewer. So I know that we talked about the screening age being 45, but let's say that you do have family history. Does that change the screening age for you? So typically the recommendations will change if that family member had colon cancer at age 55 or less. Um, we would recommend that you start getting screening 10 years prior to that family member's age at diagnosis. So for example, if you have a family member who had a colon cancer diagnosed at age 50, you should probably start screening at age 40. Um, if the person in your family was a little bit older at the time of their diagnosis, you certainly want to make your healthcare provider aware of that family history, but it may not necessarily change your age of initial screening unless you're having symptoms. If you know you have uh, colon cancer in your family and you have any of the symptoms that we mentioned, then certainly you would want to take those seriously and have them evaluated. Okay, I have another question. This one's coming in from Susan. Do you think that Lynch syndrome awareness has helped with finding finding colon cancer, colon cancer in the younger population? Um, it, it has to some degree, and we are able to define the genetics behind Lynch syndrome 
a little bit better um, now that we have um, some of the genes identified that we can screen for within families. Um, Lynch syndrome patients or patients who have a very strong history of colon cancer or some of the other associated cancers like endometrial cancer, um, those patients do need to be screened more carefully and at a younger age. So that may be um, contributing some uh, to our identification of cancers earlier in patients. All right. Well, thank you so much. I think we kind of covered everything. What do you think? I think so. I think we covered most of it. The only other question I get a lot, which uh -huh. is, is um, what can I do to prevent my risk of colon cancer? We would encourage everybody to get out of their house. I know restrictions are finally getting lifted. You want to be active. You want to try and maintain a healthy weight, eat a good diet, high fiber, drink plenty of water, particularly important in the summer, and keep things as regular as possible. A diet low in red meat or very processed foods or meats can be helpful. Um, and those are all just good general suggestions. All right. Well, Dr. Ferreras, thank you so much for joining us. We want to take time to thank everyone else for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you taking this time and giving us all of that expert advice. And tell everybody where they can find you. Um, so our office is at GBMC, uh, right on the campus um, of GBMC. We're in Physicians Pavilion East. Um, and our office telephone number, I don't know if we have it up, is 443-849-3130. We are happy to see folks and talk to them about any concerns. All right, Dr. Ferreras, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you. Talk to you soon.